peace must be our goal and our guide. And all that we strive for as a human family, dignity and hope, progress and prosperity, depends on peace. But peace depends on us. Good afternoon to you and thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Amira Mugutu and today, right now, we are continuing uh, with our conference here from the White Sands Hotel in Mombasa, a coastal uh, city in the Kenyan coast. For those who are watching us and um, are not familiar uh, with Kenya, and of course, today we had our conference and our topical reminders was the effects and solutions for African people during and post-COVID era on African economies. And earlier on in our early morning uh, session, we had Professor uh, Pierre Lolumumba uh, give us uh, his remarks there, and also Simon Akpa, as well as Dr. Uh, David Matanga. So without much further ado, I'd like uh, for Edward Kusewa to start us off in this afternoon uh, session, and then that will be followed uh, by a few other individuals. Uh, that will be Javan Karanja, Douglas Kirimi, and then uh, Patrick Mukanga, as well as Samuel Sawish. Then after that, I'll open the floor to the rest of our participants who are joining us on Zoom, and you'll have a bit of time to give us your thoughts. I thank you so much. I saw Edward Kusewa. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. I don't know whether you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, and uh, the audience are also saying uh, for you to increase your volume, they're not able to hear you. And also, I want to share my screen. Uh, could you please enable me so that I can share my presentation? All right. All right. They will enable that. And on my on my voice, I'll try. I really can speak out as loud as Dr. Matsanga, but I will try. I will try. <laughs> okay. I want to I want to share my screen, uh, Miriam. Okay. I have a presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Now I'll get the presentation moving. They have enabled me, and if I have problems with my... Very well. Yes, uh, just that, I'm just organizing my presentation. Uh, I think uh, you can all see uh, my presentation. Um, Miriam, please it. Yes, yes, we can see you, you're struggling to open it. I've already opened it. I've already opened it. All right. Uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's a bit of a delay on our side, but you can go ahead and perhaps just start uh, explaining what you have for okay. us. Mm -hmm. I cannot hear you, but uh, let me continue. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really want to I thank uh, the previous presenters, uh, Professor Pielo Lumumba, who has eloquently uh, presented. He's an eminent African scholar. Uh, we truly appreciate him. He's a Pan Africanist, uh, and indeed, uh, he's a very key person in our continent. Uh, secondly, I also want to appreciate Simon uh, for bringing uh, the concept of diversity and the concept of ethnocentrism that we normally call it in the universities. Uh, the effects and solutions for African people are during COVID-19, during post-COVID-19 era on African economies. And my presentation will cover the following areas. Uh, the first uh, area of my presentation is how African countries are addressed addressing structural vulnerabilities to the economic and health effects of COVID-19. Number two, I will discuss very importantly the role of the prior stimulus in complementing the public response, both the fight and in the recovery efforts. Then I will also speak African countries, despite the economic, how How a number of countries have recorded 
implementation thing me uh, miriam am i back uh, yeah, you're back but we we i think we're having a bit of a implement on our on okay as uh, uh, kusera can you hear me no it was on my side i think it is on your side yes Impl yes i can hear you so we are not able to fully see your your, your presentation all right are you able to just just present without the presentation itself <laughs> i don't know how that is possible but yeah to present without my presentation just present with the presentation we're having troubles projecting it so can you just perhaps just take us through without it appearing on the screen uh, for the interest of time Okay, then, uh, not a problem. I'll, I also want to speak about the implementation of the African continental free trade area to support greater regional trade strategies of resilience, response, recovery in helping Africa and emerging economies. As uh, so to the introduction, the starting point is Africa, of course, Africa the home to relatively high number of low income countries with very limited healthcare infrastructure. Africa experienced a challenging 2020 due to COVID-19. Strong antivirus, increased digitalization and shifting globe trade patterns could see the region benefit from the post pandemic landscape. So we will ask the regions the resilience of African countries to the pandemic has often been linked to their respective levels of development. For example, South Africa ranks 34th and Kenya 55th out of 195 countries in the 2019 Global Health Security Index, which evaluates healthcare resilience. Many other placed further down the list. Morocco was ranked 68th, Egypt 87th, Nigeria 96th, Cote d'Ivoire 105, Ghana 106, Tunisia 122nd, and Algeria 173 in the Global Health Security Index. Again, Africa's high proportion of low and low levels of household income has given rise to new fears that many people have been left without adequate financial support. The other thing is, is increased risk due to a decrease in commodity 2020, especially for commodity dependent economies, notably oil, minerals and metals affected this economics significantly. This impact was felt more in Nigeria and, and Algeria, where oil accounts for 90% of export revenue prior to the pandemic. Countries with significant tourism sectors, such as Kenya, South Africa, Mauritius, Seychelles, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia were also in a vulnerable position with border closures and social distance measures bringing global leisure travel to a halt. And that has been witnessed as you people are in Mombasa. You can see it. While various factors have limited the resilience of African countries, a large number has specific characteristics that help them deal with the crisis. Number one, countries with more developed digital ecosystems, such as South Africa and Kenya, were able to shift more effectively towards digital payments and online education. Another positive outcome for countries in Africa was related to demographics. 
time, as compared to most global economies, had a smaller proportion of citizens in high-risk health groups. Economies to the pandemic in Africa. So I want to def I want to slightly differ from what Professor and Simon says that Africa was not prepared for COVID-19. That Africa's previous experience has greatly prepared many nations, especially in the ECOWAS, to quickly and effectively react to COVID-19. So you cannot say that African countries were ill-prepared to deal with COVID-19. We have had previous experiences with Ebola in countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Cote d'Ivoire, thus giving them an impetus, better preparedness to be able to deal with epidemics or pandemics like the one we are facing. So a number of countries in Africa implemented lockdowns, typically consisting of curfews and travel restrictions for citizens and the closure for non-essential businesses. While African countries also responded to the economic fallout of the crisis, their financial stimulus packages were considerably smaller than those of more developed countries. So according to analysis from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the average stimulus funding from G20 countries was 22% of their gross domestic product. However, for those in Sub-Saharan Africa, the figure was 3%. Furthermore, given the relatively smaller GDP of many countries in the support offered to citizens. Another response that happened in Africa during the crisis is what we are calling the private sector response. Aid government support, the business communities have played a key role in responding to the virus. African governments have embraced partnerships with all stakeholders, including the private sector and development partners. The ministries of health in Africa have been working closely with the World Health Organization on best practices and guidelines for managing the pandemic towards curbing the spread of the pandemic. For example, KEPSA, the private sector apex body in Kenya, formed a COVID-19 business response committee, bringing together key sector leaders and developed an economic management framework for COVID-19 response. The framework contains proposals for government and private sector intervention to address the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and the economy. Through this framework, KEPSA has engaged extensively with the government, including the cabinet and the president, which led to the economic stimulus package contained by the president on the 25th March 2020 and as on April has been involved in testing and providing medical care to infected people. A number of African governments have established a COVID-19 fund which is private sector led to mobilize resources towards the fight against the pandemic and affected Africans. Okay, we apologize. We seem to be having a bit of a technical hitch there from Ed Edward. With medical expertise <laughs> and urgent supplies. So what we are saying is the comp formed a crucial continent's immediate response to the pandemic. The 
want to speak about the role of digitalization in the first COVID-19. And to the pandemic was the adaptation and expansion of digital solutions. To take an example, during the early stages of the pandemic, the Central Bank of Kenya announced that would All right. Kusewa. Again. We seem we've lost a few of what you said. Yes. Uh, we seem to be having a problem with your connection. So uh, we've not even heard the couple of uh, words you've said there. Your connection has a problem. It's not very stable. It's not very stable. Yeah, but just just go ahead. Yeah. All right, I think uh, we're having issues with connection, but uh, it comes and goes off. Just go ahead. Go so ahead. Can, you, can, can you hear me now? Yes, continue. Miriam, can you hear me? Yes, continue. Okay, in a minute. All right. Another key response to the pandemic was the adaptation of digital solutions in the early stages of the pandemic announced the banks would waive fees for financial transfers conducted via mobile banking. Uh, this was followed by an announcement from Safaricom, the owner of Kenya's most popular mobile money platform, M-Pesa, that all user-to-user -user transactions under $9 would be free for 90 days and that the daily transaction limit for small and medium enterprises would be increased from $640 to $1,370. So the need to adhere to social distance guidelines also led to a spike in demand for online payments and delivery services. Poor people and small and informal businesses are having particular difficulties getting by, even with containment measures such as lockdowns and quarantines. The pace of this disruption is likely to accelerate in the months ahead. No country is exempt. In addition to the, so to, in addition to the social turmoil in Africa that Dr. Lumumba spoke about and Simon spoke about, this crisis, the impact of the crisis on the economy may cause a major displacement of people. So there's urgent need to secure supplies of essential products, contain the spread of the virus, support health systems, stabilize financial survive. In the short to medium term, Africa will have to invest heavily So I'm continuing, Miriam, mm -hmm. my last part. The pandemic has put more attention on the world's digital divide. The internet is a vital communication tool that can help communities deal with the crisis. The technology sector is helping many industries adapt to this new situation and reduce the risks, but an estimate 900 million people in Africa are not connected to the internet. Only 27% of women in Africa have access to the internet. And only 15% of them can afford to use it. People who do not have access to the internet cannot receive timely information about the crisis. They also cannot get educated about preventive measures or benefits from what we are now calling telemedicine. Another sector that benefited from digital solutions was healthcare. Many countries employed telemedicine initiatives that allowed doctors to diagnose patients remotely rather than in person. 
while drones in Rwanda and other countries proved to be useful in transporting medicines and other essentials to people living in the most remote areas. So as we seek to limit the spread of the, the virus with lockdowns and other safety measures and try to keep businesses open, the limitations of the technological infrastructure and the lack of investment become more apparent. In Africa, large companies that support local economies like banks, the mining industry or agriculture need to ensure that workers have internet access. Businesses also need sufficient capacity to run virtual private networks that enable secure teleworking and they need to be protected from cyber attacks, ETC. Despite some of the challenges facing African countries in 2020, the continent as a whole seems to have fared better than some other regions. So the key areas for recovery will be tourism as we move forward. So what we are saying is that a very important factor will be the resumption of travel and tourism. Tourism as an agent of recovery has equal importance to local economies on their foreign exchange earnings and the amount spent by international visitors ranging from the wineries, safari, cuisine and culture of Africa to the little visited equatorial jungles. jobs, foreign exchange, and contribution to the gross domestic products. So how will African economies reinvent themselves? So I think one of the ways that the uh, African economies will adapt is what we are calling the China plus one. This is a new concept and a new model. The pandemic, so many countries and companies turn towards greater reorganization or regionalization whereby regional countries call the availability. All right, we seem to have lost uh, Edward there. Uh, bad connection, uh, we apologize, but he was about done with his presentation. Uh, Edward, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, okay. Go ahead. All right. If I if there's a problem with my internet connection, then I think uh, we can continue with other presenters. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm all I'm I'm like done. Maybe the last part that I would want to speak is the African continental free trade area. If you can hear me, just two statements and I'm done. Uh, okay. okay. So, mm -hmm. so what we are saying is. For the African recovery and for emerging economies to rebound back, the African continental free trade areas offers a unique platform for countries to start trading with one another. This is the best opportune time that has been brought by this crisis for Africa to reconsider their strategy and start regionalization and start trading with one another and look at what comparative advantages each country has and be able to offer. The biggest weakness in Africa has been that we produce the same products, same commodities. We need to start analyzing what are the comparative advantages of Uganda? What are the comparative advantages of, of South Africa? And say, if Uganda is producing coffee, then Kenya needs to produce tea. If Mozambique, if Mozambique is producing maize, then Kenya we can import maize from South, from Mozambique. But very important to the continental free trade area, the rules of origin. Let us be careful that the protocols surrounding the rules of origin are kept because we do not want countries importing from Brazil and saying that this is their product. Well, we very well know that this product is from another country. I want to rest there basically because of my internet connection, but otherwise, 
Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Back to you, Miriam. Okay, thank you so much. That is Edward Kusewa uh, from right here in uh, Kenya. And for our international viewers, I see you engaged in quite a debate over there. Could you just, you know, text, write some of the questions, and then I will post them to uh, our speakers for uh, the day. And so, right, I'll just go to Samuel Tawish, who is joining us at uh, the shores of the Indian Ocean here in the coast of Kedja. Samuel Tawish. Uh, very well. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. Uh, thank you so much, Miriam. And of course, uh, the panelists have already made their contribution. Yes, go ahead, uh, Samuel. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying thank you so much, Miriam. And uh, of course, the colleague panelists have already made their submission on this very important uh, forum uh, today. Um, and I think, uh, largely uh, listening into what uh, Professor has uh, talked about, uh, what Dr. David Masanga has talked about, Professor Pia Lolo Mumba, Edward Kusewa, and everybody else who has already made a contribution on this very important uh, forum today. I think uh, almost to a large extent share the sentiment that uh, these uh, great um, African Africans uh, have shared in as far as what we need to do as the African people, uh, especially on this um, question of uh, COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 era. And uh, of course, because again, there's a lot of disruption that has been occasioned, of course, uh, through this pandemic. And what is it that the African continent really do uh, moving forward? Uh, just making sure that uh, perhaps as um, a continent, we are not going to be Samuel, we're seeing beautiful pictures there, but we can't, we can't hear your voice. Are you still talking? Sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I think now I'm back. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, I think it was also just very important, really, to bring out uh, those uh, live pictures uh, right here at the White Sand, uh, of course, uh, beach. Uh, we are actually just adjacent or right just next to the beach itself right here, uh, just trying to bring you uh, this good scenery and people enjoying, of course, you understand what uh, COVID-19 has been uh, all of Kenya and more so to the tourism industry, uh, which has been largely hit, of course, uh, owing to this pandemic. But again, I think we are gradually and slowly coming back uh, to some sense of normalcy uh, because, again, you can see people are, becoming, are getting uh, really to enjoy their time around uh, the beaches and of course uh, the visitors and the tourists who are around here. But briefly, maybe if I should just uh, go straight to this um, uh, forum and what it really portends for us as a people and uh, a continent of Africa, Miriam. At the onset, let me begin by saying, um, really, I feel elated, Miriam, to be part of and indeed a contributor of this uh, great uh, summit today. Africa has uh, so far demonstrated immense resilience uh, during the coronavirus pandemic uh, since, of course, it struck early last year, and to be specific, in March, of course, 2020. And uh, from then, of course, Africa has indeed faced a severe test of uh, the, its strength and agility, rather, because of this pandemic. But the good news remains, Miriam, uh, that this continent going into this crisis probably a good shape following decades of progress in uh, the health sector, education, and economic um, outcomes that we have been seeing uh, over time. Because again, what we need to stress here is how Africa has come out as a resilient continent, even at a time when most uh, developed countries or developed nations uh, did not hope for the best uh, in as far as this COVID-19 uh, is concerned. Of course, this uh, pandemic, uh, maybe there was a lot of anticipation, but maybe Africa as a continent was going to be overburdened, that they may not come out as was and anticipated, but again, uh, they have stood out as strong and uh, of course, uh, very resilient. Despite their best efforts, Miriam, many countries uh, in the continent today still struggle with the fragile health systems high debt levels, weak external balances, as well as high rates of poverty and unemployment. And I think this is the greatest challenge that continues to face or bedevil the continent of Africa, Miriam. Uh, and so we, even with the uh, coming in of the uh, corona pandemic, of course, we've seen the numerous challenges that this continent has continued to face, uh, even amidst uh, those other uh, underlying challenges that it has always bedeviled this continent. Uh, but again, we continually uh, try to struggle and see how best uh, we can get out of it. But to counter the fallout of the corona pandemic, Pandemic, Miriam. Africa needs a robust policy response uh, from every country on the continent paired with strong support uh, from Africa development partners in specific. Uh, in the short term, African countries should prioritize health 
um, health uh, spending uh, for the provision of essential personal protective equipment, uh, that is PPE, and of course the materials accelerations of local productions of medical supplies, including of course the, what I've mentioned, um, I've mentioned there, and vaccine and drug discovery, because Africa now relies more heavily, of course, on the other uh, developed worlds, for example, India, uh, China, Russia, we've seen, of course, with the production of the um, coronavirus um, uh, vaccine. I think uh, something that uh, Africa now needs really to put uh, so much resources uh, in terms of doing uh, research to ensure uh, that as we move forward, we are not going to be over reliance on the outside world, that is uh, the developed world, for us to be able to get this pandemic, because uh, to get the vaccine, I beg your pardon, because as it is now, we actually and remain at the mercy of the developed world, uh, Miriam. Uh, right. So, but again, equally more, money should be earmarked for scientific, economic, and social research. Uh, countries should pursue global and continental partnerships to prepare the same for any eventualities. Because again, like the pandemic uh, really struck the continent of Africa and the entire world, it has not been so easy. It, it, it came like we are not prepared as a continent, and it itself has made it very difficult for us uh, to be able to battle uh, this particular uh, problem, Miriam. Uh, let right. me now talk uh, briefly on the no, point no, of the, what the development partners can do uh -huh. in as far as helping Africa, of course, alleviate uh, the situation, alleviate themselves from the situation that we find ourselves currently, Miriam. And I think at the onset, I must say that the coronavirus pandemic uh, needs a multinational kind of approach in terms of a partnership from all the development partners in the world. Uh, talk of the Africa Development Bank, talk of the um, International Monetary Fund, talk of the UN, I talk of the World Health Organizations and so many of those, of course, development partners to see into it how we Tawish. can together, of course, have a well-concerted effort uh, in fighting uh, this uh, pandemic, Miriam. All right, Tawish, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me, Tawish? Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, talking about effects, we know that tourism industry is one of the industries that were really affected by the, uh, COVID-19. Uh, from your assessment, just walking around uh, the hotel, I, I can hear you a, a bit of uh, wind here and there, but I don't know if you can hear me. Tawish, can you, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I'm, I'm, I just want to know from your assessment, they are walking around and, and seeing Kenyans and just around the hotel and around the, the coastal city. I'm sure you, you've taken a few walks around. Uh, we know tourism industry is one of the industries that were adversely affected by COVID-19. But so far, how can you, what can you say from what you've assessed so far? Uh, Miriam, much as uh, your audio appears to me like it is not that coherent enough, I may not have heard you well, but I think if I can just imagine the question you're asking is uh, how Kenyans are trying to take the advantage, of course, of the opening up of the uh, hotel industry and, of course, the uh, movement of people uh, to try and, uh, of course, uh, have their time in as far as the tourism sector is concerned. And if that is the question, Miriam, I can tell you, I've had, of course, a walk, in fact, not necessarily here at the beach, uh, at uh, the White Sand Beach, but, of course, even outside. Uh, in terms of what Mombasa really as a city has to offer. Uh, remember, people have actually made their way, they continue to make their way, of course, to the coastal city, uh, just to have their time and enjoy, of course, uh, their time. But if I should stop of uh, specifically where I am now, of course, I am here at the White Sand Beach. I can tell you for sure that um, I've been able to spot uh, so many uh, guests or visitors or tourists, local and international for that matter. And of course, it all points to the fact that uh, people were enthusiastic that President Uru Kenyatta and his administration have eventually allowed it. Uh, that at least they can open up this industry and others, for example, people going to churches and people going to hotel and uh, also uh, maybe kids going back to school. All so right. I think Kenyans and also the okay. international tourists are All so right, much Tavish. excited and so All much right. enthusiastic. And that Tavish. is why you see, so Tavish. with such kind of tourism being boosted, I'm sure even in terms of the investment front, in terms of revenue uh, to the government itself, it comes out as enormous, Miriam. And I think that's a very good um, that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta is trying Place, just to ensure that amidst the coronavirus pandemic, uh, that perhaps there are measures that we can put to try and mitigate, especially uh, our uh, looking at what tourism really has to offer the businesses. Because again, when you close down right. the hotel, Ta Tawish, Tawish, I'll have to for, let you go. Uh, revenue. All right, I'll have to let you go. Thank you so much. Enjoy the beaches there. I'll join you maybe in an hour or so. But right now, I'd like to bring in uh, Douglas Kirimi. Douglas, if you can hear me. Douglas, 
All right, uh, Javen Karanja. All right, Daniel Wesonga. Yes, sir. thank you, man. Of course, uh, a very, very good evening uh, to you and uh, my co panelists. Of course, our uh, technical team, uh, which is in Mombasa. Of course, uh, here in Nairobi, uh, the guys are a bit chilly. And uh, I'm done. Uh, we feel that uh, things have been uh, quite a uh, very, very uh, robust conversation uh, based on the fact that uh, COVID that we interrupted. Uh, uh, the way that we are living properly, of course, uh, the economy is globally and not locally must be quite well, uh, like moving on as usual. But uh, when Corona came in, uh, we saw the uh, major economies, not only in Kenya, but uh, across the globe, uh, taking a different landing. And so many people are actually uh, looking at the situation where there is no job, uh, so we are shorted in uh, basic commodities, and the market uh, basically uh, collapsed. But uh, with time, as my fellow uh, family said, we have learned uh, to live with the pandemic. And as the general CEO said, that uh, there is nothing like uh, uh, life after COVID, but rather we found a way of adapting to the situation as it is. And therefore, that has seen uh, so many uh, people coming out with the innovation. We saw uh, so many people now trying to, uh, to, to uh, come up with ways of working in government currently going to work. So that has actually brought in a new niche which was uh, not explored before. But uh, apart from that, uh, we need to be defined as a continent. We need to have measures in place in that uh, uh, if we have a situation that we do or the one we are facing at the moment in future, we have a way of actually tackling it without having a control of the, 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 the major economic shock that we uh, especially in the continent of Africa. So Africa has to be quite innovative. If what we have to prepare in advance, we have to put in measures that will ensure that in case of such a pandemic, in case of such a calamity, we might never know about later. So we must put measures in place that will ensure that we have a proper recovery strategy. And uh, even uh, Dr. Matanga said in his uh, opening remarks, is that uh, as a continent, we have to be unable uh, to produce vaccines to be able to vaccinate our own people. That is something that we should take into consideration as we move forward, as we live with it from the early days of the COVID-19. Because as a continent, we have become so dependent on the Western powers in that we really lack the capacity to be able to produce our own vaccine, to be able to even uh, guide our own people on measures and be able to just maintain a situation where we can be able to effectively uh, get rid of this particular malady. So in future, those are things that we are, we are actually, uh, we should be looking at in, in order to be able to sustain our economy, in order to be able uh, to combat any other maybe, uh, tragedy or any calamity that will uh, bedevil our, our continent. But uh, as I conclude here, I would, I would really uh, like to just applaud the efforts that have been made, especially uh, for the uh, private sector and the government of the African countries. Uh, as you can see, so many African countries are slowly but surely opening up, and uh, people are actually uh, trying to get or uh, to need to earn their, uh, their bread. And that is something to do. You remember when COVID first uh, struck Africa? Uh, they say that uh, Africa is going to be uh, good with a dead body and uh, all that kind of pessimistic remarks. But as you can see, the continent, despite uh, some piece of must here and there, it has remained to be resilient and we are actually uh, coping up well. But uh, the two take, uh, things to take home is that we need uh, to be innovative. We need not uh, to rely majorly on exporting goods to the European markets and the American markets. Rather, we should set um, a stage where we can be able to process our own products and uh, increase value so that we earn a bigger profit, our returns uh, on, our, on our own produce. Uh, otherwise, uh, in terms of also vaccine, we also need to come up with innovations that will ensure us that uh, we do produce vaccine. It's so shameful when a country like India, 
which is actually um, moving to uh, from where we are, third world uh, strata going up is actually producing uh, vaccines, but there's no single country in Africa which is doing the same. So we should smell the coffee and raise up to the occasion and be able to do such kind of things. So to me, if we, are, we will be able to look at how to, uh, to, to, to produce a vaccine and be able to, uh, to, to guard ourselves from, from the, uh, the, the situation that we are having right now, and of course, uh, the Kenyan government has a plan in regards to that. But in the future, we also need to put measures in place where we can innovate our own and be able to vaccinate our people. And uh, also another thing now after that, we need to look at the economy and be able to look uh, to set up uh, 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 a stage where if such a, a pandemic hit us again, we do not uh, collapse and retreat as a country in an abyss where majority of our people lose jobs and we have nothing actually to get out there or even to sustain our very self. So, but uh, regarding, regarding to the scenario as it is right now, I think we are coping up well. And uh, soon enough, uh, if I could use whatever President Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, address uh, portray to the nation, uh, by at the end of uh, next year, we shall be at least now be uh, getting to where the rest of the Western world is and the de developed world is in terms of uh, our vaccines. And of course, uh, more vaccines mean that uh, more people will be getting out. And when people get out, then the economy will be rejuvenated and we shall get back on our feet and business will boom once again. I submit, Miriam. All right. Very well said. Daniel Masonga, thank you so much. And Chine uh, Mary John. You're saying Kenya is a disappointment to humanity, surely. You don't mean that. <laughs> but thank you so much for watching. So I think at this point, uh, perhaps I would invite uh, Dr. David Batsanga to come and maybe, you know, add your voice to some of the things that have been said, and then we can see how we move uh, forward from there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, after lunch, the, 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 the energy goes down. Then you pick some energy to say some few final words. But before I do that, I want to call upon is Douglas Kirimi. Are you anywhere near? I can't see these guys. Douglas Creamy. Where did he go? Karanda. Where did he go? Okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, anybody else who would like to make a comment can now raise his hand. Shall see you and uh, my my team will will point. But let me raise the points that were made by several people here. We have touched the impact of. The impact of the, the pandemic on Africa. We have seen at the beach where we are, why we brought this conference here, how tourists are beginning to come back. And the Kenya is following the protocols of World Health Organization. Most of us down here have seen exactly, and we call upon many other tourists to come in and come and support Kenya, the industry, on this month.
of August, which is July and August. But the point is, what can we do to help the businesses? You have seen people closing down businesses across Africa. That is the point we want to look at. How are governments prepared in the case of these businesses? What can they do to make sure that the people don't go down, banks don't go down? You know, when a bank goes down, like in Greece, Greece, all banks burst. Kenya has not reached that point. And that is a good thing for the policies of President Uru Kenyatta. But they, he needs help from international businesses, local businesses, to pump in into the sectors that produce oxygen. Uganda has no oxygen cylinders. Uganda is looking for oxygen after 59 years. People only make build good houses. We have a problem with us Africans that whenever we go to Europe, the, the first thing you do is to build a very big house at home. But this COVID-19 has taught us a lesson. <laughs> that that house, you might not sleep in it. You know, if you build a small house and put oxygen manufacturing equipment, <laughs> I don't know what the professor will say about this, but that's the truth. If you build a house and spare some money in Africa and put oxygen manufacturing equipment, you never know something else will come which will need something bigger than oxygen. But there is no disease that has ever needed the oxygen, honestly speaking, than this one. People with houses, people are looking for oxygen cylinders. Honestly, they are. They are. But the people invested in big mansions. Someone has built a house on 10 miles, like Cecil Rhodes. He wants to ride on a horse for five days to tell the people that this is my place. But inside, not a single machine that produces something very important to the world. I bet. Do you know what, Prof, on a second flip and others listening to me, I'm thinking about this thing very seriously. That, look, next time in my house in Africa, you know the first thing I will put in is a machine that <laughs> is a, honestly speaking is a machine that manufactures oxygen. And I want to tell Africans now, to begin now, because this thing is not going to go away. You might not need cylinders again. You need a simple machine of 200,000, which is $2,000. But the first thing we in the diaspora go, we go in the diaspora. The first thing and the first money we call, we send home, is to buy a house. But in the house, there is no cylinder for oxygen. Have you seen now? I am now going to stimulate the discussion. Have you seen that? There is no cylinder for, for thinking, for oxygen, little oxygen that you want. Let that oxygen in the body go away for just one minute. It can't take you five minutes. Five minutes without oxygen, you are done. You are gone. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers, listeners, those watching us and those watching us from the vacuum point of view, wherever you are across the world, let's learn new things. Let's learn to build houses. But in those houses, learn to build put up a small machine for oxygen. Because you never know, this COVID-19 could become endemic. 
It is a pandemic now, but it could become endemic. It is better to have your oxygen manufacturing, small equipment for long life, which you switch on with your generator, and then you will save your family. That's why we brought this conference here to tell people, to ask people that think about what is going to happen here. Why can't the African governments now begin to tell people about alternative means of a cylinder? Have you seen that? It's the audience and the people. Are you not seeing what I'm seeing? How can a country with 59 years of independence depend on Uganda oxygen plant and the where oxygen cylinders are manufactured somewhere else? Why can't you bring the technology to manufacture a non-cylinder oxygen maker which you could sell five to ten liters of oxygen once you switch on you resuscitate a patient before he reaches hospital believe me or not I can see one person wants to speak brother Kindera you are now free to speak to us now Mr. Kindera you have been given a chance you have, your hand has been up can you prepare to speak now? It's your chance. You have two minutes. Chindera, you raised the hand and disappeared. Douglas, you said Chindera, Douglas Budi. Come in, please. It's changed to Chindera. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. David uh, Masanga, for convening this great conference about uh, how we can become resilient in terms of businesses in Africa and also how we can be able to build uh, great uh, businesses and save millions of jobs across Africa. Because, uh, Dr. David Matsanga, the proper cautioning of African businesses has not been done, either from the private sector, from big corporations, and even government. Um, except a few governments that have tried to inject a lot of money in terms of uh, cautioning uh, big corporations and small scale uh, uh, businesses uh, at large. And uh, when these businesses uh, cross down, when they lose their revenue, when they lose their profits, Dr. David Matsanga, we are going to, to lose a lot of business uh, in terms of our contribution to the well-being of, of the African continent. I remember a, a recent research, Dr. Masanga, has, uh, has shown that uh, a, a bigger percentage of women are more likely to lose their jobs permanently or an income permanently due to COVID-19. And uh, uh, under the threat of COVID-19, uh, businesses are going to continue uh, uh, crossing down and others performing badly and thus denying the, of the, the bigger percentage of African population uh, a livelihood and also denying government uh, taxes that are paid by these private corporations and bigger businesses, especially those businesses that are steered by government across Africa. Uh, Dr. Masanga, remember, uh, African governments are the biggest um, uh, uh, income generators for even small scale traders. Uh, governments in Africa fuel these uh, uh, governments in Africa fuel these businesses when this, when they can affect the taxes of government and thus. Even service delivery itself, uh, Dr. David Masang, is affected. So I think um, from my perspective as a small business owner and also as a student of African businesses and the models that are, are, are accessed across Africa, we can be able to become resilient as African businesses when we, we reimagine our businesses and also our enterprises. Remember, uh, so many companies like General Motors turned out to uh, turn into um, a production of ventilators and other companies uh, that were doing uh, businesses, uh, other businesses like uh, cosmetics turned into hand sanitizers uh, manufacturers. So when businesses reimagine their structures and also reimagine their mode of doing businesses, they are going to become resilient and they are going to come back 
when this pandemic is over and they, they not necessarily they don't need to necessarily close down uh, Dr. David Masanga, they can diversify their products and services. For example, if a company has been offering physical products only, they can diversify and offer trainings and offer other things that can be uh, done online. They can go uh, digital uh, as a second option, uh, Dr. David Masanga. After diversification of their products, they can go digital. If they are, they, they are physical shops, they can uh, uh, shop and also set up their own shops online and make sure that their customers have a new experience that can be able to help them uh, venture into the online market, which is uh, largely uh, filled by uh, so many people. In the age of um, a social distance, where people would not want uh, to have physical contact with the shop attendants and all that, we can have uh, uh, um, these companies and these businesses go digital. When they go digital, for example, the Kenyan government has gone digital on most of its services. I was glad when I was registering another business uh, uh, last month. It took me one day to register uh, a limited uh, business uh, after the proper uh, documentation was verified, Dr. Masanga. If we can be able to go digital, like the Kenyan government has done to some of its services, we can be able to offer more services, reach out to more clientele, save more jobs, and become resilient in the face of COVID-19. In the middle of COVID-19 and even post-COVID, we can be able to become more resilient in terms of when we have got digital and also diversification of our product and also imagining our, our models. Most of these uh, businesses target their customers so that they can make a profit. It is said the basic definition of a business is an entity that makes profit. If a business is no longer making profit, Dr. Masanga, that is a charity organization. And I believe most of these businesses that have employed millions of uh, Africans are not charity organizations. So I believe uh, if we become uh, um, more uh, resourceful in terms of diversification of our products and services, uh, going digital and also making sure that we not only invest uh, uh, in, in, in services that we can offer physically, we can be able to offer our services online. Dr. Masanga, I believe uh, jobs can be able to be saved, businesses can be saved, and uh, income uh, generating uh, for uh, income uh, generation for uh, these companies will continue and also for government they will keep their revenues across Africa. Thank you Dr. Masanga and that is my submission. Thank you very much. Um, Douglas, Grimmy, can you show us your location on the coast? Just to show us your location, where you are, are you heading towards Mogadishu? Douglas, can you show us your location? You might be heading towards Mogadishu. Just a moment, Dr. Masanga, I'm, the co I'm in the coastal. <laughs> yeah, where? I'm in Nairobi. I'm not in Mogadishu. <laughs> no, you must, you might be heading towards Mogadishu. Please don't take any ship across there. Thank Just you. Just a moment. Thank you. <laughs> As we wait for Douglas to show us where he is, we now call upon Javan Karanja. Javan Karanja is one of my students of mass communication and the media and the politics. So I'm mentoring Javan Karanja. I want to see how he can see the effects of COVID-19 is a member of the legacy team of the trend legacy trend that supports uh, his excellency uh, the president of republic of kenya and we are here to assess the impact of tourism businesses infrastructure and what can be done you see how the protocols in the coast have been followed if you go to the dining without a mask Nobody will serve you food. And that is what we want. Several people mm -hmm. today have been stopped from those who come from Nairobi, come with no mask. They want to rush to the die, to the queue. They have been told to go back. I'm sorry, but uh, this happens. I am a very observant. They say, well, you see, when they tell you to go back, it's very funny. But it's very good to teach you that you must have that mask in the coast, anywhere in Mombasa. In a hotel, they are very strict on that. So, Karanja, come and we see you have only paraphrase your paper, you have only four minutes. Yes, uh, 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. David Masanga, and the rest of the contributors, Professor PLO Lumumba, and uh, Edward, and the rest of the team, <coughs> and uh, for the other participants. Thanks for this conference, Dr. David Masanga. It's a timely conference because we are discussing something that is a, a reality with us. Uh, you know, COVID-19 is something that we, we are dealing with and is a, is a reality. And we must come up with ways because in our culture as Africans, when you are faced with a calamity, you must come up with ways to ensure that uh, you salvage yourself. You come out of that situation uh, alive or you come. Therefore, on this conference, we are here to give ways and to, 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 port, uh, to point out some of the effects of COVID-19 in our economy, in our social life, also how, how, how COVID-19 has disorganized even the political arena, because we understand as we speak, there's, there's ban of political gatherings and so on. Therefore, there is a lot that is happening. And uh, I'll start by saying effects of COVID-19 in African economy, it has majorly affected the, the tourism sector uh, because we know airplane air, air uh, travels have been banned. Therefore, as a country, especially Kenya, where we depend on almost uh, that, uh, above that 5% of our economy, especially here in, in coast where we are, we depend on tourism, both for wildlife and uh, other sanctuaries where tourism, tourists come and, uh, and uh, enjoy uh, seeing these uh, beautiful uh, places. Also, it has affected domestic tourism because uh, as, we, as the beginning of this COVID-19, we had cessation of movement where people could not move from one county to another. Therefore, this affected in a very big way the tourism sector. And we know even to some extent the hospitality sector at large, uh, members, uh, the workers were laid off maybe prematurely and others were laid off without their payments. Therefore, it has caused a lot of distress in that area. Also, when you come to the, uh, the oil producing countries, like when you look at uh, the countries like Angola, Nigeria, you'll see that they have suffered badly because they could not export their oil, uh, the crude oil uh, for fine uh, uh, processing to where to their destination, like the Arab countries. Therefore, this have affected their economy. Also, it has also affected uh, uh, a lot when it comes to the growth of our economy. Because when you look at some statistic, you'll see that uh, the continent of Africa was estimated to grow to for to grow with a, a rate of 3.9 per percent. But due to COVID-19, this has caused it has caused a very big. A setback where now the economy is growing at a rate, an average rate of 0.5 percent. Therefore, when you look at that, this shows that an, a number of people have really lost the, uh, 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 their jobs. And uh, you know, a lot of companies have shut down, and uh, this has caused a lot of this. And when you also look at the effects of COVID-19, you cannot go without the mentioning of the issue of. Uh, our, our, our health, uh, it has really strained our health sector, where workers and uh, the, 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 the health practitioners have been forced to work for more hours uh, than what they used to do when we didn't have this COVID-19. Also, we have other people who have been suffering the, the disease, who have contacted the, the disease, and uh, this has left the people and their uh, families with a lot of emotional and uh, physical distress. Therefore, when you look at that aspect, you'll see that there are people who are suffering due to COVID-19 emotionally because maybe they have lost their loved one, uh, a member of family have infected the disease, and they have incurred a lot of losses in terms of seeking uh, treatment. Therefore, at that point, you see the kind, the emotional distress, and you know, to some extent, we cannot be able to estimate how large this suffering can be. Therefore, these are some of the things, uh, and uh, it will remain in hearts of many Kenyans. When the word COVID-19 will be mentioned, they will remember uh, how uh, their loved one, uh, the, how they lost their loved one. Someone will remember how they, they, uh, they contracted the diseases and the kind of struggles they went through. As, as a country, we, uh, as we, uh, the same scenario, when, when we remember the 2007, 2008 post-election violence, there are still people when you mention about the 207, 208 post-election violence, they have that pain because they have not healed. Therefore, there is the issue of um, emotional suffering and a distress that have been caused by the by COVID-19. And uh, also, the, 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 uh, the, there are a lot of um, 
social interaction uh, like uh, the weddings, the church and uh, the barrios have been disorganized. Therefore, we have been forced with a new reality because now when you go to churches, you must follow a certain order and uh, you find that some churches have closed down. When you go to our barrios now, we, we, we don't do it the way we used to, to do before COVID-19. Therefore, it has uh, uh, posted a new normal uh, to us. Therefore, those are some of things that uh, I'm just uh, trying to outlight uh, the effects of COVID-19. Also, when you look at the issue of immigrants, as a country, Kenya, we have uh, the, the biggest camp of immigrants in the country. And these guys have been suffering because when their loved ones have uh, caused, contracted the diseases and the, due to the cessation of movement and uh, the disorganization of the economy, you'll see that the, the, the remittance that they used to get from their loved ones, the small income, the small salaries, the, uh, the small money they used to receive from their loved ones, they are not getting it uh, uh, as, as they used to do. Therefore, this has caused them to suffer a lot when they are in these uh, uh, camps, uh, the refugee camps and so on. And uh, also the issue of going to schools, uh, you know, even our calendar as we speak, we are trying to see how we can uh, tighten up things to ensure that we recover the time that was lost when our students were at home. Therefore, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of challenges, uh, and all of us are a witness that COVID-19 have touched us in one way or, or the other, because when even when you look at our courts these days, they used even to do the digital and virtual hearing of these cases, and to some extent it was not effective to Kenyans who don't who are not familiar with the technology and where the internet is low therefore these are some of the challenges and uh, the solution uh, that have been uh, and uh, the best thing with covid-19 it has caused and uh, I, I think is a point you know I've majorly mentioned on the negative aspect but still on when you look at the issue of covid-19 you cannot go without mentioning the positive side of uh, the story uh, because <laughs> we have seen a lot of uh, a digital revolution, courtesy of this COVID-19. <coughs> These days when you go to our churches, you'll find <coughs> even the local churches, like where I come from, even in our home church, now they, they have come up with a digital way to ensure that they reach their congregation when they're at home. Therefore, to that is a positive <coughs> uh, thing. People have embraced technology. They have uh, embraced the power of social media. Now we are, can work from our, the comfort of our homes. Therefore, and we have embraced the use of technology, the laptops, and so on. Therefore, this is a positive thing, and this is something that we, we live with, with. And it has also caused the issue of just, we can now have a new uh, perspective or a mindset where we can see our homes as an office, where we can still earn an income from home. And that is how we have the Zoom meetings and so on. Therefore, when you look at the issue of COVID-19, you know effects are both positive and negative. There is a positive side for me, and that is the revolution of, uh, of the uh, technology and so on. Under some of the uh, solutions, under some of the uh, mitigation, mitigation measures that has been put by governments across Africa, as I, I make my point, as I finalize on this, is the issue of uh, tax relief. You know, even in our country, uh, we have given a tax relief and uh, the VAT was reduced to about 12% uh, there, and uh, you see other tax reliefs to ensure that people are able to sustain themselves as they go through this uh, uh, pandemic. Also in other countries, you find uh, also here in Kenya, they were offering an emergency uh, food grant incomes to those people who have been laid off uh, their jobs, and uh, there was a, a weekly uh, uh, a, a, a weekly donation to their funds that was uh, being done via M-Pesa. Therefore, when you look at this issue, the governments across <coughs> our African continent have come up with the ways to ensure that they, they curb <coughs> the spread of COVID-19 and also they ensure that their people are safe. And uh, finally, uh, the governments and those who function, the governments, especially in our country, ensured that those guys who function and who work in essential services, the essential service provide, uh, providers in the country, like doctors, teachers, and the media personalities, they were not laid off. Therefore, this ensured that there was a continuous growth of the economy, although it was in a small way. Therefore, that was a very uh, a, a good way of ensuring that uh, we we grow our economy because the, the essential service providers were still uh, uh, working, and uh, that was a very uh, good thing. Also, there was the issue of um, 
Thank you. And uh, you, you see, after the COVID-19, a lot of markets were shut down. But the government ensured that the farmers the government ensured that uh, farmers and other essential service providers would continue doing their job. Therefore, this ensured that we are food uh, sustainable and we had the food we had the food to ensure that uh, we, we keep going as a, as a country. Therefore, that was a very good thing. Therefore, at the end of it all, COVID-19 is still here with us. It's a reality that we are dealing with. And I will urge the viewers and uh, the participants here and uh, others and uh, the, the people in the room that we continue ensuring that we wear our mask, we sanitize, we wash our hands, we avoid places that are overcrowded so that we can win this war uh, uh, as a team. Because as our CS, Mutahikagwe keeps telling us that in order to win this war on COVID-19, it will take personal responsibility. You protect me, I protect you. When you find me in a manner that suggests I can spread COVID-19 or I'm not behaving the way it's supposed to be, please advise me accordingly so that I protect myself and I will also protect my, I will not put my family or those guys I interact with regularly at risk. Therefore, th that is my contribution. And uh, what I know, we had other uh, pandemics before. We had the Ebola, we had the Spanish flu, and uh, we won successfully. And in those years, some of the disease, like measles, were are chronic and uh, they were quite dangerous. And they claimed a numbers of lives. But today, we have, we have been able to eradicate them uh, completely. Therefore, one day, COVID-19 will be defeated and I will be able to walk out of the wood successful and we'll go back to the normal we used to know under the positive side of embracing the technology. I think that is something that uh, from COVID-19 is something that will remain with us. Therefore, on that point, Dr. David Masanga, thank you for the conference. And uh, I beg to, uh, to, to pass my contributions and uh, I submit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a student. Karanja is one of my people who has followed one of the few student professor I'm trying to mentor in political science and mass communication. He's a journalist by background. He does very good research for the legacy trend and uh, he's well of us, he stays in Nanyuki. Keep it up, don't, <laughs> don't get dry when you come on the microphone. Yes. It is very difficult to, to address, the world is watching you. Yeah, yeah. But you've done a great job today as a mentor and a teacher. <laughs> I'm happy, thank you very much. Ah. Asante. Asante, sir. Next is, who is left? Huh? Yes. Oh, we have Mr. Pambe only, and then the professor wants to give us closing remarks, and we, we do the necessary. We move to another chapter. Uh, we can see cream. Douglas cream seem to be on the boat going, going away to, <laughs> to Somalia. I wish you good luck, but make sure that they don't catch you on the boat. <laughs> It seemed to be going somewhere on the boat. So thank you very much. I call upon Pambe. Pambe is also a very good person. Tune, mute, mute, mute yours. Mute your thing, Douglas. Yes, thank you. Pambe is the head of radio in my in our department of Punchline Africa TV is for Radio Africa, Radio Punchline Africa. is one of the radio stations I created online together with this television, but he is very vast on Kiswahili. So he's going to speak mostly Kiswahili to Kenyans at the coast first, greet them, Wambie Mambo, Tanzania, 
what is happening in Dar es Salaam, how the COVID has affected East Africa briefly, then you can make you a few points and I give way to our greatest leader who is here today, our chief guest. Uh, uh, Hamjambo wa Kenya wenzangu. Uh, popote pale ulipo pia Hamjambo wa Afrika kona zote enzi zote wa wale ambao wanazungumza Kiswahili. Hususa ni kwa vile tuko hapa katika county ya Mombasa. Bila shaka uh, ni siku njema tu ya kuweza kuangazia angazia masuala haya. Jina langu ni Mpambe Mkanga, almaarufu uh, Patrick Mkanga na ningependa sana kuweza kugusia gusia kuongea uh, kuhusiana na masuala ya biashara namna ambavyo uh, virusi vya corona ama tandavu ya corona ilivyo zuia kuendelea ama maendeleo ya biashara na mambo mingi tu kuhusiana uh, na uchumi na bila shaka kama tujiwavyo ni mengi ambayo yameweza kusemwa hapa kuhusiana na athari ama the effects of covid-19 pandemic lakini mimi ningependa kutoa suluhisho ama suluhu kupendekeza baadhi ya suluhu ambazo zinaweza kutumika katika hali moja ama ile nyingine kuweza kufufua uchumi ambao umeathirika barani Afrika. Na katika hali hiyo hiyo basi ninaanza tu na kuangazia kwa wale ambao wangependa kufanya biashara katika wakati huu ambapo tuna uh, tunazungumzia athari za COVID-19 je wanaweza kufanya nini ili waweze kufaulu katika biashara zao jambo la kwanza ni muhimu sana kuweza kujua ni biashara gani unataka kufanya je ni soko gani la hivi vidhaa ambavyo unataka kuuza lazima ujue ni watu gani ambao unataka kuwauzia hivi bidhaa usije ukauza bidhaa ambazo huenda wakati huu ukija vitakuja labda ku, kukaa tu pale vitakuja kurundikana pale kwenye gala ama kwenye store kwa hivyo katika kiingereza utasema to identify long term market alafu katika swala nyingine la pili katika suluhisho ya biashara to determine whether innovation is uh, your addressing is long term je hivi bidhaa ambavyo unataka kuuza ama hii biashara ambayo unataka kuifanya ni biashara ambayo itafika kesho iishe ni biashara ambayo itafika labda na Juma de Jalo ikabilike hilo jambo muhimu sana kuweza kufahamu wakati unapofanya biashara ili iweze kukaa kwa muda mrefu iweze kukusaidia labda kuleta zile fedha ambazo ungependa ni muhimu sana kuweza kujua vitu uh, ambavyo unataka kuuza vinachukua muda gani vinataka uh, vitasaidia watu kwa njia gani Another point map your business model. Ni muhimu sana kuweza kufahamu kwamba ni mfumo gani utakuwa unaweza ku, kuuza ama kuendeleza biashara hii. Je, kama ni labda vile bidhaa ambavyo utakuwa unatoa kutoka kule ngambo, unataka kusambaza katika mataifa mengine. Ni muhimu sana kuweza kufahamu je, vitachukua labda muda gani? katika yale maeneo ambayo utakuwa unavitoa kufika pale je ni bidhaa ambavyo labda vina vinaharibika haraka ama ni bidhaa aushi kama tunavyosema ni bidhaa ambavyo vinakaa ama bidhaa ambazo zinakaa uh, kwa muda wakati ambapo uta, utakuwa unafanya ile biashara alafu ya nne kabla sijakamilisha consider your customers perspective when interacting with them wakati ambapo unafanya hii biashara ni muhimu sana kuweza kusikiliza pia nini ambacho eh, hawa customers ama wale wateja wako wanahitaji na utatumia mbinu gani tumia mitandao sasa hivi iko mitandao Facebook fuatilia weka pale bidhaa zako weza kufuatilia uweze kuona je 
hawa wananiambia nini utakuja kusoma mambo mengine mageni mambo mapya kutoka kwa wao kama ni kitu kibaya watakueleza kama ni kitu fulani wanataka uongezee hapo watakueleza yote ili uweze kufanya e, ziwe bidhaa zenye manufaa kwao wakati ambapo utawauzia halafu mwisho you brush up on your virtual selling skills ni muhimu sana kama wakati huu sasa tunavyozungumza hivi mambo mengi yameenda virtual ninavyoweza kusema katika kunukuu mambo mengi sasa hivi yanafanyika kimtandao watu hawakutani ovyo ovyo maana kuna zile sheria za ama masharti ya kuzuia virusi vya corona ni muhimu sana hii biashara yako wakati unaendeleza ni muhimu uweze kufahamu eh, njia za kuweza kuwafikia wale wateja wako ambao unawakusudia kabla ya kuwauzia kila ambacho unauzia tumia mtandao ya kijamii kama vile Facebook utatumia labda Zoom wakati mwingine una, unaandaa Zoom meeting labda na wale ambao eh, 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 wale ambao eh, unawakusudia kuwafikia kununua hivi bitha, eh, hizi bidhaa zako tumia mtandao kama vile Instagram ni mitandao ambayo ipo sasa hivi na inatumika wazi kabisa na mwisho kabisa uh, ningependa kuwashukuru na vile vile kueleza kwamba hakika covid 19 imetufundisha mambo mengi yale ambayo yamesemwa hapa tutaweza kubadilisha uh, mbinu ya kufanya biashara tutabadilisha mbinu ya kushughulikia masuala mengi katika maisha yetu na tukiangazia kwa mfano kama uh, ukanda wa Afrika Mashariki tunazingatia kwamba biashara katika ukanda wa Afrika Mashariki zimeweza kuathirika lakini hata hivyo kulingana na vile tunavyoshuhudia ni kwamba viongozi wa mataifa haya wanajaribu kuweza kufufua uchumi huu kama alivyosema mwenzangu pale uh, aliyezungumza kabla yangu pale bwana uh, Javan pale Karanja amesema kwamba rais kwa mfano rais huru kinyata wa taifa hili amejaribu kujitolea pakubwa sana katika kufufua uchumi katika mbinu tofauti tofauti hata wakati huwa janga la corona bajeti ambayo ilisomwa hivi majuzi na waziri wa fedha bwana ukuru ya tani bila shaka iliangazia njia ya kuweza kufufua uchumi wanaita zile eh, covid 19 recovery perhaps eh, business recovery ama economic recovery inakuwa ni njia muhimu sana wakati ambapo itafaulu mbinu hii ambao wameitumia ama zile fedha ambazo walitenga kuweza kusaidia katika hali hiyo zikitumikia vyema basi bila shaka wa Kenya watafurahia ningependa basi kuachia mahali hapo na kushukuru kila mmoja hapa na muona pale uh, Profesa uh, Pierre Lumumba ningependa kumshukuru uh, daktari uh, David Masanga pale na wengine wote ambao wamechangia katika hatua hii kuweza kufaulu leo hii bila shaka yote umekoa walezi wangu na ningependa uh, tuendelee katika hali hiyo kuweza kufufua uchumi wa Afrika kwa ujumla ni hayo tu kwa sasa Asante sana ndugu mpenzi. Swahili yangu ilipotea makati tunilitoka Tanzania makati ya sabini na nane. Lakini utanisaidia utakwambia uta tafadhali ndugu mpenzi. Asante sana kujua ambao najua maneno hii ya, ya kuendesha Kiswahili kwa Radio Punchline Africa hiyo ndio radio moja kwa online na mu, muziki kutoka rumba i was I'm a very good rumba dancer only that the energy is going away slowly slowly asante sana na shukuru sana endelea namna hivyo mungu akubariki yes. have i done it yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so finally <clears throat> we want to come to summary I don't think there is anybody else waiting. 
I don't know whether Dr. Edward has come back. If you have not come back, thank yes, you. Yes, Dr. Matsanga. Yes. Yes, I'm here. You have come back, but we still, our time is over. And uh, the guests down here would like to move away and go to another session. So therefore, I want to thank you very much and to thank others. You had finished your points anyway. Mr. Do you want to speak, Mr. Gogobera? Mr. Ogobera, do you want to speak? About, although what? I don't know. Mr. Obona, do you want to speak? Oh, everybody fears and runs away. So thank you very much, Prof. This is the moment for closing remarks. And then we move on to another agenda. I want to thank everybody worldwide, those who have listened, I'll do that later on. But I want to thank my co-host Miriam for having been there and stood on this session. And we want to thank all the millions who have worked and I'm sure they are multiplying this video from morning. I want also to thank the brother of Namudikanu for coming out to exonerate our television completely and my name out of the mess that has taken Africa by, by, by difficulties and uh, which we don't know how it came about. Chindera, do you want to speak? Yes, sir. If uh, Dr. Mumba is still here, I would like to ask him a question. Okay, Dr. Lumumba is listening. Go ahead. But let's see, let, can we see your face a bit? Thank you very much. My question will be very brief. Uh, Dr. Lumumba, I greet you from here. Thank you very much, sir. Is your brother Chidera. Um, I just want to ask you a question because Dr. Lumumba is one of the men who respected so much in Africa. And I have followed him and he preached Africa unity. Now, Dr. Lumumba, you preach an Africa unity and educated man like you, when Donald J. Trump labeled Africa as a sheephood, all of you professors and the educated one came up and said, no, Africa is not the sheephood. Now, our leader, Master Namdekan, traveled all over the world. He has never been arrested. He has never been in anywhere near anybody harassing him in the airport. First time he traveled to the same city called Africa, he's now been arrested. That's number one question. Number two, what are you going to say about that? Because most of the educated ones are the ones making this argument, telling us how Africa is very beautiful, how Africa is going to be united, how Africa is going to have resources. We all scattered here in Africa. As I can tell you, most of millions of Africa, immigration can't even document us. They can't even guarantee you stay in, even in Africa country. But now they can't travel all over. And this is Africa. I do not arrest him, handing him over to Nigeria government, which we are safe, well and known. Now, secondly, if Africa is united today and to become one nation, which since over 60 years now, no single toothpick can Nigeria produce, will you, Dr. Romambo, advocate for Nigeria to be president of Africa? With going on with no even for how many years now, Nigeria has not been anything, and they over 200 million. They covered most of the Eastern Africa. If the same vote, Nigeria will clearly win an election because they are more in population. Will you advocate for a Nigerian president to Africa? See what who they are now. God bless you, sir. Uh, Professor Mumba will answer. Professor Lumumba will answer you. And I think before he comes, he has made his stand very clear. Come, come, Professor. He has made his stand very clear that for Africa, the bad example of Africa is Nigeria. I think on several occasions he has said so. The disintegration of Africa starts with Nigeria. 
until we rearrange Nigeria, until most of the countries rearrange themselves and stop the stupidity of cross-border. They promised us set passports, African passports. They are not there. They have eaten the money. They promised us everything. We all took photographs and sent it to Africa, the Union. Piero, his passport got lost. Someone ate the money and we don't see the passport again. What the hell is this Africa? I, I, at times, let it be rearranged. Tigray, they have rearranged themselves. Have you seen the Tigrayan people? They have rearranged themselves. There's no more Ethiopia anymore called Ethiopia. It is going to rearrange itself that way. We, we, as much as we want a united Africa, give the Biafrans the right to decide where they want to belong. You cannot kill them, then tell them to belong to the same shoes that kill them every night. No. Professor, it is your turn. Thank you very much. It is very easy to respond to your question in a simplistic manner. I will not be simplistic. Africa is a complex continent and whenever we talk about unity, we are not naive. We do not believe, at least I do not believe, that one day something will happen suddenly and we break the existing sovereign states. It is going to be slow and gradual. And I want you to read the instruments of the OAU in 1963. Read the instruments of the African Union. Read the instrument creating the Africa continent of free trade area. Read the instruments of SADAC the instruments of East African community, the instruments of ECOWAS. And you will get to know that even as we talk about unity, it is not going to be easy. You will appreciate that many countries in Africa are now laboring under rebellion. I remember as a young person, working as an intern in the office of John Garang de Mabior before the country now known as South Sudan was created. Dr. John said in Khartoum, we are not people who want to break up Sudan, but let the Khartoum government make unity attractive. I've said it in no lesser place than in Lagos and in Abuja, that Nigeria stands at a very critical position in the life of Africa. One in every five Africans is Nigerian. And the history of the disunity of Nigeria is not new. You will remember courtesy of history what happened that I talked about a little before the Civil War, the meeting in Aburi in Ghana, the Justs featuring Chukwemeka Odume Gwojuku and Yakubu Gowan. It is not easy. And much more recently we have seen the activities of the central government in Nigeria and the activities of Boko Haram and the agitation in Biafra and in Odudua, it is not easy. It is important that the central government listens and I've heard Namdi Khan speak and say that what they want is a referendum to determine whether the people of Biafra should continue in the Union or the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I'll use this occasion to draw your attention to other activities in the continent of Africa. The people of Ambazonia in Cameroon are saying the same thing. The people of RBA 
in Sudan are saying the same thing. The people of Eritrea said the same thing before Eritrea, Eritrea regained their independence. The people of Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile and Darfur are saying the same thing. The people of Kasamans are saying the same thing in Senegal. So that there is a, an, an issue here that Africa must examine her systems of governance if the continent is to know genuine and sustainable unity. Let us not be under any illusion that it is going to be easy. It is going to be difficult. It is going to take time. It may not happen in your lifetime, but history has demonstrated consistently that an idea that is genuine and legitimate once planted in the hearts and minds of men never dies. What one would urge, which is not happening, is under the aegis of the African Union or under the aegis of the regional bodies that these conflicts should be confronted and resolved. Recently, you saw the conflicts that were taking place in Chad, in Mali, in Mauritania, and I was one of the very few I know who came out and urged the ECOWAS group of countries to confront those issues. My answer to you, let us not think that it's going to be easy. Lives will be lost. People will be maimed. Property will be destroyed. It is not going to be for the faint-hearted. It is not going to happen on Zoom or Twitter. It is going to happen on the ground. And my counsel to all of us is that we each play our part in order to ensure that people's legitimate right to self-determination is given its pride of place. We hear you. I have had the privilege and honor of addressing the Senate in Nigeria, of addressing the House of Representatives in Nigeria, and I've spoken boldly and firmly about what I think should happen in Nigeria and will continue to do so. You who are on ground zero, you have a duty that is heavier than ours. Ours is to support all legitimate circumstances. I've myself been declared persona non grata in Zambia and turned away at the airport, notwithstanding that I'm an African. So that when I speak about these things, it is out of personal experience. I've had to stop visiting some countries because there were legitimate threats against me. So this is not for the faint-hearted. And when we choose to come out, we know that there could be consequences about them. And that is what we urge all of us to remember at all times when we come out and expose ourselves by word and deed to those whose lives and livelihoods we threaten by speaking the truth. And that is all I wish to say because it is also a bad war general who makes public what he wants to do and how he intends to prosecute his or her agenda. So wisdom also demands, among other things, that those who are confronted with enemies must know what to say and when to say them, because it is very important that some information is only shared on a need-to-know basis. Let me also use this opportunity, therefore, to speak my final words, to say that a conversation such as this is very relevant. And I must uh, thank the Pan-African Forum Limited for bringing people with diverse views. One of the things that would have worried me if I came to this meeting and we all agreed and oh, we all had different perspectives there is only unanimity in a cemetery. 
When you have the land of the living, people will always have ideas and even have different perspectives. Let this not be a one-off engagement. Let us pick out the ideas that are relevant. Let us engage outside of this forum in the knowledge that our duty is only to play our part. This morning and this afternoon, we have focused on the impact of COVID-19. And COVID-19 has had both economic, social, and political implications. There are governments that are now using COVID to visit pain and terror against their populations. There are people who are using COVID-19 to rip and rape their nations. All these are issues that deserve our attention. And I hope, Dr. Masanga, that we will have these occasions and when time permits, we will be able to engage a lot more elaborately and a lot more robustly in physical meetings where we are able to meet our good friends from Biafra, from Ambazonia, from Darfur, from the Blue Nile. And I do hope that our good friends across the continent who are victims of oppression by regimes which are in denial are also in the business of coordinating their affairs. I would want to hear that they coordinate their affairs. That is how it was during the struggle to liberate Zimbabwe, to liberate Namibia, to liberate uh, Nyasaland, and that is Malawi, and Zambia, to liberate South Africa. I also do hope that conversations are taking place within Nigeria specifically. Those who are oppressed must come together as a condition precedent to their realizing their ambitions for the sake of the unity of Africa. And let me finally say, the struggle for self-determination and the struggle for unity are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I hold the view that it is only when a people are allowed to self-determine that they become greater votaries and protagonists of unity. If you deny people the right to realize and to enjoy their dignity, then you may talk of unity, but that unity is not unity. It is something else. And that is what African leaders must be told. We must not, in the name of unity, be hard to say that the people must go through pain of dehumanization and humiliation. Thank you very much, and I wish you the very best as we go forward. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As we go to the final leg, I used to play football. And my number was number 11. And the, all the time, it ends up, sorry, it's uh, Get me another mask. Another mask in there. My number was number 11, and all the time, Professor PLO and others, the ball could be sent to number 11. And uh, number 11, the mask. The ball could be sent to number 11 and the professor number 11 had to come and finally as you want to score, the whistle goes <laughs> and we lose the time and end the football match. I am a supporter of Liverpool a Football Club for 45 years now. 
and those who are in different clubs I don't care now. And uh, some of your clubs hit us so badly this year. We are waiting again to hit you next year when the time comes. So I wish all of you good luck in your football clubs. And above all, above all, I want to say before I finish, one of the guests says he wants to thank Professor Pierlo. He has never been, <laughs> he has been waiting for a long time to speak on the same platform with you. And that is uh, our guest from, one of the guests from our Biafra called, uh, my friend called Simon Ekipa. Eka, a what? Aki. Simon, <laughs> Miriam is my interpreter on this one. Akipa. Simon Epa. Yes, Simon Epa. Epa. You, yes, Epa. You kill the K. Yes, I can. Yes. It's like a Matsanga. You kill T. Thank you. Ekipa. Thank you. Simon, I give you a few minutes to say bye bye to our friends to convey me uh, greetings if there are any. I understand the lawyer of Namudi Khan has just been allowed to see Namudi Khan. I have seen it on the news in Nigeria. I don't know whether that is true. And I think the truth is coming out now once he sees him. Let him confirm to us these rumors that are flying around about the truth. I don't know whether you have also seen something like that, but there you are, you give us, put us in one position as we send ourselves and I wish the rest of the world. The key points that have been raised here, all of you who attended will receive our report and those who are here, it will come in a booklet which will form a basis of further discussions on Africa. Thank you very much, Simon, take away. Take it away, please, for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Matsanga, for, for this uh, opportunity uh, given to us and uh, given to me to be on this platform today with uh, a respected, well-respected It is good that uh, I believe from this day we will begin to see the change that we have all yearned for in Africa. Having listened to Professor line of speech in this uh, closing, in this year's closing remark, I would say that I am now one of the happiest person that will begin to talk and speak the way it is. Professor, in his uh, closing remark, he mentioned that we can't allow the uh, issue of unity and kill ourselves. It is just brief. We cannot continue to preach unity and at the same time a danger our lives that will expose our people to the kind of killings you see in Nigeria today. The truth is that every reasonable person will understand that Africa has come a very long way. Africa has come a very long way. And it is time we Africa people, Pan-Africanists, those who believe that Africa will be a great continent in the nearest future, it is time we begin to speak to the authorities 
and advise them the way forward. We know that a lot of leaders in Africa do not want Africa to progress for their own selfish and ulterior motives. They believe that Africa must embrace a certain religion, the Islamic religion, before they will begin to preach or agitate for a better Africa. Anybody who knows how the nations of the world become what they are today, the powerful nations, must rise up to begin to preach truth to those who will listen. We know that it is going to be very, very difficult for those who have ulterior motive other than the civilization of Africa to agree to our line of thought. But it is better we start this campaign now than later because delay is dangerous. Dr. Lumumba also, Professor Lumumba also mentioned that if something is not done, if Africa is not renegotiated, if some of the countries in Africa are not renegotiated, we are going to expose ourselves to a serious danger. I am happy with that, that statement. I'm happy for the fact that he understood that if we do not renegotiate, especially starting from a country like Nigeria, where the diversity is a very dangerous one, if we do not start to renegotiate as soon as possible, immediately, Africa is a boy. Nobody wants to be part of that. Nobody wants to witness that. Every one of us here today and those who watch and those who are watching have a role to play. The role of every intellectual, like Professor Lumumba, is to change the narrative. What narratives are we changing? Changing the narrative, telling the authorities in Africa the way it is. We have to reach, go as far as reaching people in the Western world. We have to begin diplomatic process, telling the world and convincing them. We don't need to convince them because they know. But may I use the word convincing them to know the reason why they must accept the proposal that we want to be, we want to be as developed as they are. When you talk about Africa, when you talk about Nigeria disintegration, they tell you. If Nigeria disintegrates, that they are afraid that other African countries will follow Nigeria. And then I ask, what are you then afraid of? Is there something you know that you now believe that we may have come to know? Is there some kind of secret behind civilization that you believe that we shouldn't know? Because as far as we're concerned, some of us have lived in diaspora in the Western world for many decades. We've spent almost half of our life living in Western world. And if we learn nothing from this Western world, it means our lives, we have lived useless and unproductive life. We have come today to identify the reason and the secret behind the success of the Western world. And we say, we want to be like them. We want to be like them. We are Africans. We may not apply the same system like them, but we also want to do what they did that made them what they are today. And when you preach disintegration, they tell you they are afraid. It is now the responsibility of people like Professor Lumumba to take the lead, to enlighten, educate our people in Africa, the need to divide along tribal lines. We are not going to do it at once. 
it is going to be a process. The process of Europe is still ongoing. As I'm talking to you today, European Union, you have the European Union, and then you have the member of the Schengen. You have the member of the Schengen state, you have the country that comprise Europe. Not every country in Europe is a member of the Schengen state. It is a process. As I speak to you today, many countries in Europe are applying to be member of the Schengen state, giving them the free movement, the right to free movement within the European Union. So it is going to be a process, a long process, but let us start that process from Nigeria. Nigeria disintegration will give the backbone for Africa, for the civilization of Africa, for the development in Africa, for the misgovernance, the correction, and all those impunities, corruptions going on in Africa. The disintegration of Nigeria will solve almost impending human rights and the, and the crisis that is to befall Africa and the world. I was reading in one of the articles written by someone in Africa that uh, Africa ready to take over 200 million people from Nigeria because Nigeria is about to explode. There is possibility for us to avoid Nigeria exploding. Everybody today knows that Nigeria is a of exploding. It is going to affect every single person in Africa. We are now in a global village. Every single person in Africa, it is going to affect directly or indirectly. We do not want that to happen. We still have the possibility, the opportunity to make our voice heard. And like I said, I am very happy to be part of this program today. I'm Professor Lumumba. We are looking up to you to start changing the narrative as a Pan-Africanist. Thank you very much. May both of you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. And thank you very much. There is somebody who has been told by the government somewhere in Zimbabwe to speak to us. Or in his personal capacity, I don't know. Saxon, you have been very late. We are about to close, but from Zimbabwe, southern part of Africa, let's give you time. Uh, Saxon. Uh, okay, thank you very much. You have you have two minutes to three minutes. All right. Tell us uh, no, about, no, okay. about the obstacles of the pandemic, how you are solving it, how you are prepared, how many hospitals are there? Do you have oxygen? Is oxygen a problem? What about the business? Is business co being conducted? There is a new lockdown in Zimbabwe from 5 to 6 a.m. in the morning. So I don't know how you go home. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, the lockdown has been an eye-opener to us Zimbabweans in particular that we need to start believing in ourselves, not to rely on uh, other people. Uh, the, the, the fortunate part that we had, our vaccination program has been a success, a resounding success, despite us being under economic sanction. This is, is a result of um, the, magnan uh, the magnanimous uh, relationship, relationship that our government has forged over the years, since uh, the days of the liberation struggle. Uh, we are in a lockdown, but uh, business is normal. We are just saying uh, people.
people will need to conduct their business within the specified time. We're also having uh, increasing numbers, but we, the, viral, uh, the vaccination process is uh, tremendously improved with, with long queues, uh, people taking vaccination. They are now discussing the conspiracy theories who were against uh, the uptake of the virus. And you, I think you are aware of the, 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 the challenge that we have been having with issue of vaccines. Uh, the East-West war, uh, our people have uh, started valuing their lives. They've, they realized that these vaccines that are taken from China and Russia, they are safe. We haven't had any side effects as compared uh, to what others have experienced, like our neighbor, South Africa, uh, to what the conspiracy theorist has been saying. We're coming to think of it, our business, our economies are taking shape. Only yesterday, our press opened uh, uh, in fact, uh, the law opened the uh, commission uh, for uh, production of transformers with power has been a challenge in Zimbabwe as we are relying on uh, the Wange power station which was constructed by them, former colonialists, and when they imposed vaccines, we couldn't buy space. And uh, thank God, uh, because of um, the relations that we've had with other countries, our power generation has improved. Uh, I think by year end, we won't be importing power because normally we during peak periods, we need 200, 2,000 megawatts. Currently, we are producing about 1,400, but uh, soon we will be self-reliant. Africa needs to start believing in itself uh, if we are to uh, develop uh, and uh, change the tag of being a, a third world country or a poor continent. This is, uh, uh, we need to start believing in ourselves, change our, our education system. I think I once said our greatest, greatest on doing is in the curriculum that we we inherited, which uh, uh, really gets us to be employees, not employers, and we don't ever we can control the, de the, the destiny of our our destiny. Uh, the, uh, our economy is taking shape despite the challenges that we've been having, because most of the mode of production are now controlled by the local people. We've, we've now got over 500,000 small scale miners, 300,000 people uh, ventured into agriculture. Because uh, the, all the resources in the world are either mined or farmed. The reason why we were colonized, the reason why we've got all these wars, like in Nigeria, is because there's got oil. The disturbance are as a result of natural resources. So I believe um, Africa needs to take a stand. stand so we are the, you know, the youngest population. By 2050, our economy is likely to be the largest economy. How do you achieve that? By starting to believe in ourselves, investing in ourselves, Trusting ourselves, empowering our youth with the youngest population, we can do it. Uh, we need to start believing in ourselves. We, have coming, uh, we need to have, we have free trade area coming up with a common language which we can use to communicate, to which we can relate with our people. We are a bunch of people. If we start our history, we all come, most of the people in South Africa came from Central Africa. But because of the colonial boundaries, we can't believe in ourselves. We have good boundaries, we have good visas, visit each other. But we are brothers. We need to start believing in ourselves. We can develop. I believe, uh, I'm not a pessimist, I'm optimistic that the, the, the reason why I started talking about this is to send a message to whoever, to our youth, to the younger generation that we can do it. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing impossible. I thank you. Thank you very much. First, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. Right, those watching and the millions and the millions of you will watch this summit across the world. We have spoken our minds, we have tried to bring out what makes Africa not prepared Key words that came out is one of them is diversity, unity, ethnicity, being reactive. I think those are several keys. We might take, I think I've taken one point that Professor Lumumba said. We might take long to unite. I think, I don't think, to be very honest, if a Kenyan wants to go to South Africa, you need to carry 
a box of documents to get a visa at the South African embassy anywhere. So how are you going to unite? How? If you want to cross over to Somalia, you can't even take there your food, banana, to eat from Mogadishu. <laughs> you need a special permit. How will you unite? Ha! Ah. Is it very elusive? It is. But the journey begins now, and you, the future generation, it is up to you, the younger men and the women here, have not seen any woman from the diaspora speaking apart from Miriam, and I want to thank my PA for Pan-African Forum, Michelle Juno, who is who has been recording everything behind the scenes. Michelle, thank you very much. Because whatever I've missed here, I will get it. I want to thank you, madam. Continue doing that good job in a location which is known to me only <laughs> so that our notes don't disappear. Thank you very much. I want also to thank Simon, I want to thank Edward, and I will lastly thank the man from Zimbabwe who has just come in. I want to thank all, above all, the brother of Mr. Khan, Namdi Khan, who spoke much earlier, who step and the recordings we shall have, you know, play back to the world. We thank you very much for all your support. Above all, I thank Professor P. L. O. to take his time to travel to the coast of Kenya, the coastal line of Indian Ocean, to be with us in this conference. Tomorrow, as Punchline Africa TV, we continue with very early morning, 8.30 session of our news for one hour, reporting from the coast. And we shall be talking about the things that we missed today ourselves. If you want to join in, it's up to you. You can listen and tune in from wherever you are. We can see so many people, correspondents, dotted around the coast. In the morning, they will be told to go around various points in the coast and give us as early as morning from each location what they have seen in conclusion as we wind up. I want to take the opportunity to thank those in the hall who have come, who have been my crew, who have been working from 6 o'clock in the morning to the 5.30 actually. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank the hotel for giving us the hospitality, the food. is still plenty. Some people want to run out because they might not manage what is there. Some, but we have to eat. And the professor, we invite you, sir, after your shower or your rest a bit to join us together for a small a cocktail at a place called Loco. What is it called? Loco. What is that cup down at that the beach? The beach. Coco. Coco Beach. Yeah, that, that, because I am, I am working the appetite of the people on online so that they can the next time when I invite you come in. I know Simon wanted to fly to come but please enjoy <laughs> enjoy the weather in Finland for us we've finished the conference and we want to go and do some other things. I want to thank all of you. Thank you very much. God bless you. God will always guide us. 
Now, before we go, I just want to pray again. As we close, I ask all of you, <clears throat> all of you on the on your on your Zoom, we are praying now. Let's pray for the world and let's pray for Namdi Khan and other people who have been caught up in a situation of this nature in Nigeria, in Amazonia, in Central African Republic, in Libya, and in many other places. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you very much for giving us here the whole day. Since morning, we have listened to very various voices. We have listened to various speeches. We have listened to the, all the people from different opinion. We have shaped the opinions, the opinion of the world towards the pandemic COVID-19. We have tried to find a solution, objection, ob obstacles, sorry, obstacles, success, where it has been successful, contained like in China. We want to see it done on African continent. We have prayed for Africa to be prepared for this because we don't know when it will end. It might not end as Simon said. It might be endemic and remains with us like malaria. Let every African try to find out extra oxygen by trying to help what can create oxygen instead of creating wars, abducting people, imprisoning people, beating up people, let the government stop doing that. I pray to you, Jesus Christ, that today, let there be change. Let that change come through us. Let it come through the discussion that we have made here today. Let it give salvation to those that yearn for it. We do pray for Namdi Khan to go through the process and God guides us. We want to ask the Nigerian government to explain to the world how they managed to intercept a man who was flying and going wherever he was going as far as they have said they intercepted him. They said they intercepted him. We don't know how, whether they had a plane in the air and diverted the plane. We want to find out the truth. And that truth will set everybody free. And we want to pray that Namdi Khan speaks to somebody and tells us exactly what he went through so that people stop making speculations. I pray all this together with our journey home and our next engagements. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I have a beautiful song that I used to sing. And I want to sing this song. Prof, before you leave, I'll sing it in Uganda. And I'll explain it in him. And I tell you a miracle. I'll tell you something. Prof, this song saved me. And this song goes like this. I want to say this song. The song to Baganda, to Ugandans, is this. <clears throat> Te wali munsi muno mlongo fu songa te wali ba muguru wabula ban 
abantu beyalo ngosa munabe mumusai kwa Yesu munabe munabe wabula te wali and that song goes on i think you know it te wali musimuno mlongo fu songa te wali ba muguru that there is nobody in on earth who is not a sinner <laughs> there is no clean so those guys who pretend to be going to church every morning better than others they might not be good people until you reach the eyes of god have i turned into a preacher today again i don't think so don't call me bishop matanga please my father wanted me to be a bishop mumusai 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 in the blood i think can you translate it in swahili hakuna mtu ya kiswahili hapa kidogo mtu ya kiswahili ndio huyo lakini i think simon you can see how divinity simon <laughs> you can see how divinity has gone into my head <laughs> i one of these days don't be shocked that you will find me with my church <laughs> eh? yes my church the ten lepers <laughs> who are healed and the only one who came to say thank you <laughs> so there you are so thank you very much thank you all of you god bless you god bless africa this station therefore is for africa with africa by africa ciao thank you very much